I remember asking the nurse if I was going to die. I remember the nurse said, I don't know. And I remember being really, really scared. Hey there, my name is Sean and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives and we almost never talk about it. We certainly don't talk about it enough and when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, are not very good at it. So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. If... You are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at suicidenoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And there's another way you can reach out. It's in the show notes. You can leave us a recorded message, an audio message. I love those kinds of messages, not surprisingly. So check the show notes on how to do that. And in the show notes, you will also find other information about upcoming events, our programs and presentations, and our membership, which is just about to launch. If you have questions about any of those things, please reach out. Happy to talk more about them. And also, I should add, I would really like to hear what you think of the podcast, whether you like it, whether maybe you don't like it, what we're doing well, where we can improve, maybe a question you'd like me to ask our guests. Message me, audio recording, email, whatever works best for you. And of course, if you like the podcast, please rate and review on Apple. It really does help. Before we dive in here, we are talking about suicide on this podcast. As the title suggests, we do this every week. Take that into account before or as you listen. I know it's not necessarily a great fit for everybody, but I do hope you listen because there is so much to learn. Today, I'm talking with Susan. Susan lives in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and she is a suicide attempt survivor. Susan in Massachusetts. How did we find each other? I Googled suicide podcasts and yours was the first one that came up. A big part of my story is my book starts out with my suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. It, It was a long time ago. It was 38 years ago. However, I feel like that's where my journey started. Yeah. And, and I've done a lot of thinking and replaying that time period in my life. Well, I appreciate you being open to sharing what you went through with us and with our audience. I would imagine if you're writing a book or you've completed your book, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong anytime during our conversation, but that it's also, it's probably not just for you. I'm assuming maybe it's for, hey, people are going to read this. They're going to get something from it, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah, to to help other people who are who are at that place and to let them know there's definitely a way out. I mean, for me, what I picked up 5 years later was a spiritual thought system that I feel gave me a lot of clarity as to the meaning of life. And I've been wow. studying this for about 33 years. Yeah, it's quite, it's entitled A Course in Miracles. I've also found a, other Course in Miracles students who were suicidal or tried to commit suicide at some point in their life mm-hmm. because the world that we live in I mean, it's just really hard and it's based on fear and there's a lot of pain here. It kind of made sense to me that that Mm. would happen and that would start my journey. I mean, A Course in Miracles tells us that the world, this world is not our real home. So I guess at that time period, I guess I just wanted to get out. There was so much pain inside me that I couldn't deal with. So I, I guess it was a combination. I didn't know how to process the pain. And I also didn't feel comfortable being here. That sounds like a very precarious spot to be in a tough spot. Yeah. So 38 years ago, all right, 
where does the story begin? This is always challenging when we're trying to figure out how to put all of the stuff in an hour or less podcast episode. So, of course, you start where you want to start and lead us up, if you would, to that day that you tried to take your life. There was a lot of psychological abuse in Mm -hmm. my childhood. Mm. And I always, I, I couldn't connect with my father or anyone. I didn't know how to process feelings inside of me. So I I always felt completely disconnected. And I was, Mm. and I was trying to connect for quite a few years. And, and I would always be reaching out to, to different boyfriends. And I, I became sexually promiscuous because I tried to connect with my body, but then Mm. there was this loneliness that I experienced afterwards because I I thought I was connecting because I was, I was having sex, but I wasn't connecting. Mm. I just felt guilty and disconnected. My father was very aloof. He, he just didn't open up to either me or my sister. And I think I was struggling and I was searching for this connection that, that I couldn't feel. And finally I said, okay, if, if only I can mold myself and I can um, appear beautiful on the outside and I can become a model, well, that's going to solve all my problems. Then finally, I'm going to feel like I'm connected to something. So I went through this whole ordeal where I got some plastic surgery on my body. I had my my nose done. I had my breast done. I lost all you know weight and I was working out every day and I was 5'10 and 120 and I looked really glamorous in front of the, the camera. And then I took some pictures and I went to some agencies. I lived in Boston at the time. I got accepted by the top Boston agency. And for like a day, I felt good. And then I realized afterwards that even though I got what I wanted on the outside, it didn't satisfy me on the inside. I still didn't feel connected. I still felt isolated. I still felt lost. I saw no way out of this pain. And that's when I made the decision to end it. And uh, how old were you at that time? Or is that is that asking too much? No, no, I'm comfortable sharing my age. It, well, I was at that time. I mean, it was it was this is preceding the attempt. So I, I made the attempt in 1985. I was I was 20 years old. Okay, 20 years old. And thank you for sharing what you did. I'm wondering up until that point, had you ever thought about suicide as an option? No. Okay. Not up until that time. No. I think I had been down Mm -hmm. a few times, but no, I had never, I had never considered suicide prior to that time. And had you ever lost anybody to suicide? Was it on your radar, like in any way? No, I had never lost someone. Uh -uh, Mm -hmm. No. All right. So 1985, 20 years old, you're in Boston and you're thinking about doing something that's, how do I say this? It's pretty hardcore, right? You don't, probably come back from this. I know it depends on your your values or your religion. And I always believe, and perhaps I'm stating the obvious, that you must have been in just a tremendous amount of pain. I planned it. It wasn't spontaneous. I had the whole thing planned. I did it twice in the exact same way. Went out and I got six bottles of over-the-counter sleeping pills. I put them in my dresser drawer. I had the day planned. I remember ingesting them. I remember laying down with the pills in my body. It was a little bit, you know, I had this fairy tale image in my in my head. Imagined after I took the pills, my dad would see my dead body laying on the floor mm-hmm. and he would cry because he was he was so stoic all the time. I just wanted to see him cry. 
And I thought when he looked down at my my dead body, then it would make everything worth it. But I really didn't didn't, didn't think it through that clearly because I wouldn't have been there to see it. This is true. This is true. So two attempts, and they're kind of close to each other. And the first one, obviously, you survived. And I'm thinking you're a planner from what you shared. Did you start planning the second one right away? No, no, not right away. I just, I I went home and I was living with my parents at the time. And there was a part of me, I think, that thought things might change right immediately after the first time. Because after the first time, I felt very, very guilty. But then my head was still in this dark place. So I started planning the second time. And both times were exactly the same. Both times I laid down to die. And then both times I jumped up like in hysterical fear, trying to get one of my parents to take me to the hospital to get my stomach pumped. So both times, you know, I guess if I had really, really wanted to do it, I wouldn't have jumped up. I took the six bottles of sleeping pills, laid down, and then jumped up. Like I changed my mind right after. Okay. And did your parents take you to the hospital either time? Both times they did. The first time my mom took me to the hospital. The second time my dad took me to the hospital. Okay. So both times they they knew what you did, it sounds like. And I'm wondering, let's go back to the first time. I mean, what do they say? What do they do? The first time my mom just stared at me when I told her what I had done, like she didn't believe me. And then I kept repeating it, you know, two times, three times, four times. Finally, she believed me. She was shocked and she was shaky. And I was the one that was saying, come on, come on, we got to get in the car. Come on, come on. So I was the one that was that was in control when she dry, uh, drove me to the hospital. We stopped at um, an urgent care unit. Well, we were we were passing an urgent care unit on the way to the hospital. And she thought it might be better to stop at the urgent care unit because the urgent care unit was closer. And we went into the urgent care unit. They couldn't pump my stomach there. They had to get an ambulance to take us to uh, me to the hospital. And at that point, we were wasting a lot of time. We shouldn't have stopped at the, the urgent care. I remember asking the nurse if I was going to die. I remember the nurse said, I don't know. And I remember being really, really scared. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time we went to the hospital when uh, my mother was driving. The mm-hmm. second time, it was my dad. And with him, it was a whole different story. He loved me, but he was very verbally abusive. And when I told him what I had done, he started screaming at me, you know, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? And he just Mm -hmm. started berating me. He said, I'm not going to drive you. I'm not going to drive you. If you want to die so bad, why don't you just die? And uh, I begged for him to take me to the hospital. And finally, he did. All right. Okay. Well, I this is the same man who you wanted to find your body at one point. So I'm thinking all of this must have been just just a lot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the outside, he was he was always very, you know, hard and abusive. Mm -hmm. On the inside, he did love me. He just didn't know how to show it. Yeah, right, right. So you survived the two attempts, again, obviously. And in the years since, the many years since, have you ideated? Have you thought about it? Have you dabbled? Have you come close? No, no. I have gotten down at a few points. I've, I've, you know, had some really great time since then. I really think, you know, when I I really feel connected to to life is when I embody these these principles that I study now, these spiritual principles. And I've also 
had down times, but mm-hmm. I never have seriously thought of of killing myself since then. And what changed? Because if you try to take your life twice in a pretty short period of time, I would think for most people, something needs to change or you're probably going to try again. Because I've, I have done a lot of emotional work since then. I mean, at the time that I, I tried to kill myself, I had no training or knowledge is a better word on how to process feelings. I, I mm. think that was a big reason that I that I attempted to kill myself because I had a lot of feelings built up and I had no knowledge of how to process them, you know, because because in my family, if something was wrong, you know, and I was feeling sad and I, you know, let's say shared it with my dad, he would start talking about the weather. He would start talking about something completely unrelated. And my mother too, even though she was, she was very warm, she didn't feel comfortable talking about feelings. And I think that's what led to my suicide attempts. I, I had all these feelings bottled up. I didn't know how to process them. And this is why I didn't feel connected to myself or anyone else. Since that time, I've been through a lot of therapy Mm -hmm. and I've learned how to process feelings. So yeah, sometimes I've I've gone through phases, periods in my life where I feel really good. Mm -hmm. Other times I've gone through through phases where I've been struggling. I'm more comfortable now sitting with feelings. Owning my pain is essential. At the time where I was suicidal, not knowing how to to sit with my feelings, I think is what led me to try to kill myself. That makes sense. Does anybody know other than your parents and perhaps some hospital staff about your attempts? I think so. Now I think so because it's the first chat. It's in my introduction. So and I've had quite a few people read the book. I mean, for a while, I was I was embarrassed about it, and I didn't mm-hmm. want anyone to know. I think that's probably common. Some people who attempt suicide are very ashamed. They don't want anyone to know. At this point, I think, you know, my book is From Suicide to Serenity. So I think now there's there's a lot of people that know. Right. And more when they buy your book and more when they hear this podcast. So just so I'm clear, going back for a moment... When you're growing up, 20s, 30s, you didn't really talk about it, just didn't come up, wouldn't go there. Yeah, I think so. I think Mm -hmm. so. I don't think I, I I mean, I went through a period for a few years where I was home in bed during, during the suicide attempts. I was hospitalized and I was home in bed. I was, I was very depressed uh, I put on a lot of weight. I was, I was, you know, 120 when I was uh, ready to be a model there. By the time I was ready to get out of bed, I think I gained at least 50 pounds. Okay. And so for somebody that wants to model, that's got to be hard. At that time, yeah, I put on, I put on about 55 pounds. Yeah. I was just home, sleeping, eating. Okay. So that's a, that's quite a long time, a few years and I'm wondering, did you ever, not that I'm a huge fan of diagnoses, but they can be helpful, right? They can certainly be a tool. Did you ever get a diagnosis that you agree with, that you think was correct or accurate? Well, yeah, I was I was diagnosed, I think, with clinical depression. And it was, it was I'm sure it was accurate. They wanted yeah. me to go on, um, you know, antidepressants, which I'm not for or against, I chose not to go on them. I remember just, I, I went on them, I think for a couple weeks. And then I started just throwing them down the toilet. I didn't, I didn't want to go on the antidepressants. I did smoke a lot of cigarettes. I remember I was smoking cigarettes at the time, but yeah, I, I think I was clinically depressed. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was very, very difficult. Very yeah. difficult. Well, that's a long time to be in pain and suffering. So I've got to say that there is something in you clearly that has some fight and some resilience and some something. Uh, because Just to not die, not just to stay alive, to survive, you know? Yeah, 
I mean, I, I think at the end of the of the few years, it was always very body conscious. And, you know, at this point I was I was pretty heavy. Something inside me said, if you if you keep acting like this, you know, it's it's nothing's gonna change. This is just like this this hell that you've manifested. And and finally I just got out of bed and I got a waitressing job and I went to uh, this diet place and I went on this Nutrisystem. I think that's what I did. I went to Nutrisystem, okay. mm-hmm. I went on a, on a diet. I got a waitressing job. I started waitressing and I just kind of re-entered life. Five years later, I moved to New York City and I and I started my modeling career. And that's what you did for a period of time. You were a model in New York City. Yeah. Yep. I started modeling at about, well, I started modeling at 20 or I tried to, but then I had my suicide attempts. Then five years later, after I came out of the depression, I moved to New York City and and I started modeling. And at this point, no more suicide attempts, no more major depressions. And I stuck it out. My mother actually passed. She passed away and that was really, really difficult because the moment I got out of the depression, then all of a sudden I have this, this horrible event happen. I was so frightened of getting depressed again. I remember I didn't even cry because I, I, I wasn't going to let myself get down. You know, I didn't know the, the difference really between being depressed and grieving. So I just kind of shut off my tears when she passed. Because I was just, you know, I mean, it was hard, really hard when she died, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I was, I was, I was mortified of getting that far down again. It was terrifying. It's still probably my worst fear. Yeah. I imagine that's one of the reasons why people try or try again, right? Is the fear of being back in that place, whatever it looks like for you or whomever, right? The fear. I have a question about the modeling world. Yes, I don't know much. I'm probably way off here, but it doesn't sound like maybe the most healthy place in the world or environment to be. Is that accurate? For me, it was it was a really good experience. I think it was part of my my life's purpose, my soul's purpose, because before I modeled, I thought that being beautiful on the outside was the best thing that could ever happen to someone like if you're if you're beautiful on the outside well obviously you're going to be confident on the inside and after spending some time in New York i realized that so many of these gorgeous people had so many insecurities so for me, that's when I started my internal search. Mm. You know, the the modeling kind of kind of forced me to look inside of myself for the answers. So that's when I found, you know, not only Course in Miracles, which I've been studying for so long, but I also did a lot of of uh, therapy and read a lot of books on on uh, just how to be a happy person. And for me, it worked out. There are a lot of superficial people in the business, but it kind of pushed me in the opposite direction. Wow, that's interesting. Really interesting. So you've been doing the spiritual work, your spiritual work for a while now, a long time. Yep, I found I found a course in miracles 33 years ago and a course in miracles too. It's not Have you ever heard of a course yeah. in miracles before me? Oh, you have. Mm-hmm. Do you know anything about it? Not much. Okay. It's not religious. It's not mm-hmm. religious. It's it's uh spiritual but not religious and it's also there's a lot of like psychological components I found. It talks about bringing the darkness to the light so it can be healed. And that's what Freudian psychology is about, bringing the the wounded inner child, the pain points inside of us to the surface so it can be healed. And that's what A Course in Miracles says. You know, you have to bring that those wounds up, you know, to, to release them. And that was, you know, for me, just transformational. I wonder what might have happened had you never found the Course in Miracles? 
Well, I believe in a lot of things. I believe it was it was published in in 76, I believe. I was born in 64. I think I was born, I believe in reincarnation, you know. I believe mm-hmm. on a deeper level, I kind of chose to live at this time period. So I was mm-hmm. kind of destined to find mm-hmm. that text. I yeah. also think in a way, maybe the, you know, talk about regretting the suicide. And I thought about that too. I mean, I just wonder if maybe that was part of my journey. Yeah, of course. Sure, sure, sure. So all of it being, including the attempts, yeah. That's what I think. That's what I think when I when I just, you know, I remember my mother knew that I was very depressed before I tried to kill myself. Mm. And she said to me, Susan, if anything was to ever happen to you, she said, it would kill me. She said that before I tried to kill myself. And then I did try to kill myself, knowing that it would kill Mm. my mother, which is pretty selfish in a way. Two years later, she died. I think I've, I've, and I had a lot of guilt over that for a long time, but I think I have forgiven myself. I mean, when someone tries to commit suicide, it's just, there's so much pain there that they Mm. don't know any better, you know? I mean, I never wanted to hurt anyone else. I only want to hurt me. I don't even think I wanted to hurt me. I just wanted to get out of all that pain. Yeah, sure. I mean, you do what you can do until you can't do it anymore. That's what I think. That makes complete sense to me. In all that time, in all those years since, and I think I know the answer here, but I want to ask it anyway, did you ever wish either of those attempts had turned out differently and that and that you died? Yeah. Yeah, I have I have a mission mm. and uh I'm so glad that I'm still here to accomplish that mission. So I'm I'm very grateful that I'm still alive. I'm also very grateful that I didn't do any permanent physical damage because I even remember after the suicide attempt I I was like feeling my leg to make sure I could still feel. So I'm grateful that I I made it through. Okay, yeah. And does anyone in the world know that we're talking today? My husband knows that we're talking. My a few of my friends know that that we're talking. My sister knows that we're mm. talking. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, you write a, you wrote a book. When you write a book, you're probably pretty open about this stuff. By the way, is your is your father still alive? He's not. He passed away a year ago at the age of 97. Did you ever get what you were looking for from him? I Worked on forgiving him for the last 20 years of his life. I mean, I <laughs> I loved him and I still love him so very much. I have his ashes like right next to me on a, on a counter. Mm. And uh, I love him with, with all of, of my heart and soul. I think I, I'm very close with him. I, I don't think... He ever really opened his heart to me and allowed himself to be vulnerable with me just because he wasn't capable of it. Yeah. Near the end, I realized that he wasn't able to connect with himself. So therefore, he wasn't able to fully connect with me. I still believe he loved me very much. And I think. I needed to forgive him. Like that's yeah. what I needed to do. So every time I would see him, like he was, he was staying by me here in Massachusetts, um, a couple miles away in a nursing home. And every time I went to see him, I would just work on forgiveness. And and near the end, he had severe dementia. So he was 
in a very like childlike state, like during his life, he was very tough and he was very hard and he was very, mm. you know, as I said, verbally abusive at times near the end because of the dementia, there was this childlike quality in him. And I, and I remember I would, I would play him Shirley Temple on the good ship lollipop on YouTube. And he would just sit there watching her like a little boy. And he would bop his head back and forth, you know, this strong military man, you know, kind of watching Shirley Temple in a childlike state. And uh, he would, he would say, isn't she cute? Isn't she just so cute? I would say, yes, daddy, she is. I always called him daddy. And, uh, and then, you know, like 30 seconds later, I would say, do you want to see Shirley Temple? And, and he would say, oh, yeah, because he would forget that he just saw it because his dementia was so bad. Mm-hmm. So we would sit there and we would watch this one on the Good Shep Lollipop YouTube video over and over. And, and it, so there was this, this kind of connection that I had with him at the end because of the dementia, which was nice, which was nice. And I do have a lot of love for him right now. And I miss him. Mm. But did we ever have that connection that I craved? Probably not. And how many people do you have in your life to really have a a tough conversation with when you're going through difficult times outside of therapist or counselor, friends, family, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I have I have um, a good group of friends that I can talk to. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my my close friends. I, I and I still I still do get down at times. Mm-hmm. What I I really look for in friends is I look for them to not try to fix me, not try to save me, not mm-hmm. to feel sorry for me just Mm -hmm. to be fully present with me and hear me. Not all of my friends are able to do that. You know, some of them are my sister is because I I feel like we grew up in the same family and, and she can really hear me and honor my feelings. I do have, have people to talk to now and that's, and that's just really helpful. Yeah. Huge. Are there any myths around any of this stuff that you'd like to discuss or dispel or just flat out call bullshit on? Well, I think that if someone is feeling down, I think that it's important to talk about it with them. You know, people sometimes think if they say the word, it might push someone to do it. I don't think that's true at all. I think people want to be heard it's to to bring it up and into the open is is very healthy some people might think that someone who tried to commit suicide or did commit suicide is is like mentally unstable crazy well that's not true at all i mm-hmm. mean there's there's a lot of very well-known people recently that have actually been successful at the at the suicide you know they're not they're not crazy they're not whacked out they're just people in pain and they they don't know how to deal with it you know like robin williams kate spade anthony bourdain i think his name was like e like these amazingly talented people who try to kill or did kill themselves. No, not try to kill themselves, did kill themselves. I remember just recently I read that article about Anne Hesh. What happens is there's just this, this pain inside them and all the success on the outside can't eradicate that inner pain. That's why they do what they do. I mean, the world teaches that if everything is fine on the outside, you're going to feel fine on the inside. Well, that's not true at all. That's kind of like what I've studied over the years. You have to find that peace on the inside because Mm. no matter what is on the outside, it, it just really, it can't kill the pain on the inside. If the pain is there, it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be processed so it can be transformed. Yeah. 
But in terms of myths, it's just it's just people are not crazy. They're just in pain. And then communication right. about the pain is so very important. And it's really important for the other person, too, when listening to someone talk about their pain. You know, nobody wants them to feel sorry for them. Nobody wants to be fixed. People just want to be heard. So mm-hmm. if somebody needs to talk, just be present with them and mm-hmm. show that you're listening to them. And I think that is is just very healing to be fully present with someone who is in pain can help transform the pain. Why do you think it is or it seems so difficult for people to actually do that? Because people aren't comfortable with their own pain. If you're not comfortable with your own pain, you're not able to sit with someone else's pain. That's a very good question. My father was never able to own his own pain. He was never able to accept his own feelings. So when I was in pain, he wasn't able to be there with mine. If you don't Mm. accept pain within yourself, you can't accept the pain or hold space for the other person to be in pain. That's when you you either like change the subject or or try to fix them or start feeling sorry for them. And uh, that's the worst thing that you can do. And that actually led me to my suicide attempt in the first place, because that's how my father treated me. Yeah. Many of those things that you brought up, I call the conversation killers because that's what they do. They not only kill conversation, but you know, this is a this is a bit of a big one I'm saying here, but they are in part responsible for people just losing hope. They don't have anyone to talk to. That's just it's it's so huge, you know. Yeah. I always I always quote this this poem by Araya Mountain Dreamer. It's mm. called The Invitation. And she has this one line in the middle of that poem. She says, I want to know if you can sit with pain, yours and mine, without trying to hide it or fade it or fix it. And that's really hard to do because people try to deflect pain. They try to keep busy. They're not, they're not comfortable just, just owning their pain. And, and if you can't sit with your own pain, you can't be there for somebody else. And, and again, I'm, I'm saying the same thing again, but it's so important. That's what led to my suicide attempt. The fact that my parents just didn't have the, the skills to, to hear me. I needed to be heard. So and was your sister around then? Yep, she was there. She was five years younger than me. Okay, that's a I big difference. Don't I don't remember where she was the day I committed tried to commit tried to commit suicide. I I do remember she came into the the hospital the next day to see me with my parents. I felt really really guilty, mm. and she was shocked that I did what I did. But yeah, she was she was five years younger than me. So she was 15 years old at the time. Ah, uh, okay. Right, right, right. And I never want to make any assumptions, but I'm pretty sure I know how this one goes. I always ask people, is suicide an option for you moving forward? Yeah, definitely not. Suicide is definitely not in the realm of possibilities moving forward. Okay. And at what point between... 20 and mid 50s, did you say, you know what? I'm going to write a book. I uh, think I planned to write the book years and years ago. Um, before my mom asked, I told her that someday I was going to speak about God as I understand him. I had not yet found A Course in Miracles, but I just knew that someday I was going to speak about God or spirituality. Mm -hmm. Um, The book, probably about 20 years, actually not probably, 19 years ago, I decided I was going to write the book. 19 years ago, I came up with the title for my book, Surrender to Joy. And 10 years ago, I started writing it. 
off and on in excerpts. It was it was a very uh, healing experience for me writing the the book. I didn't I didn't write it straight through, but I I would write it off and on, and and it was a, a really cathartic experience. I bet. But it's amazing in all that time, you never just stopped. You just kept it going. I know. I took my sweet time and I'm a perfectionist. So I kept going over it and over. Yeah, of course. Really doing my my best to make my points as clear as possible. And is it officially finished? It, it's just about to be published now, so it's it's the final. It's in the final end of the publishing process. It should be out on Amazon within the next two months. Wow! I'm working with an editor and a formatter. I still have the um, a, f- a few little parts to to go. And do you think you'll ever be completely? satisfied with the book or there'll always be one little part that you want to go back to and tweak or change it's going to be out in a couple of months yeah so, i have good. i have it just the dedication and the acknowledgement so just you know the foreword is done a friend of mine did a foreword she's an author i'm i'm happy with the points that i've made i think it's nice. it's clear and what is the name of the book? The book is Surrender to Joy, From Suicide to Serenity. And it's teaching the transformational truth of A Course in Miracles. I came up with that. You know, there's mm. there's different books on A Course in Miracles. My business is Trust Transformational Truth. So on the bottom of the front cover teaching the transformational truth of A Course in Miracles, because it really is transformational when you can embody the concepts. And what is the business? Speaking. I I speak on the transformational truth of A Course in Miracles. And who do you typically speak to? Right now, I'm I'm speaking twice a week online. When my book is is published, I plan to expand. Got it. And how many? So how many chapters are in your book? There are ten, two hundred pages. Ten chapters, two hundred pages. What are the titles of one or two of your chapters? The first chapter is Depression is My Darkness. The second chapter, Fitting with Our Pain. And then one of the chapters is Sympathy Separates. Empathy can be very healthy, but sympathy is just looking down on someone. So that's Mm. just not what we need when we're in pain at all. So one is Sympathy Separates. So there's an introduction to my book that can be seen right on my uh, website, surrendertojoy.net. Okay, we could put a link in the show notes to your site. Uh, Do you have kids? I don't. No, I don't have kids. I have a niece and a nephew, Mm -hmm. but no kids. I guess years ago, I wanted at least one, but I guess it wasn't meant to be in this lifetime. So yeah. I mean, we talked about that earlier, right? That maybe the attempts were part of it all and maybe, maybe not having kids. Right, right. Maybe Mm -hmm. I had so many, or maybe I had a couple children in my last lifetime, but in this <laughs> lifetime, I was meant to uh, to write and to speak. Absolutely, yeah. And how or why did you choose the word serenity, that particular word for part of your title? Yeah, I think I think that was kind of downloaded to me from a higher consciousness. I know surrender to joy was, and I I think from suicide to serenity it has a a really nice ring to it Mm. i remember i was i was telling a friend about that title maybe a a year ago before i started the publishing process and he's like oh that's kind of intense isn't it to use the word suicide in a 
in a mm. subtitle, but I, I think it's perfect. And I think they're they're kind of like polar opposite, you know? And and being that I have the butterfly that represents transformation, like suicide is is complete darkness, serenity is complete light. So it it symbolizes transformation. We all have a connection with the divine when we can like release our fear and just open up. I feel like the the higher source is always wanting to to and willing and able to download information to us. Like my my uh, business name, Trust Transformational Truth. I feel like that was just kind of of downloaded to me too. Okay. Susan, I have one more question, and then, of course, I'll open it up to anything else you might want to share. What do you think happens when we die? That's a great question, and I have I have really strong opinions on that. I think we are spirit. We are we we have these bodies, but the essence of who we are is spirit. So when we die, well, we actually don't die. All we do is we release our body and then we go home to to heaven. Like I I believe in heaven. I do not believe in hell. I don't think there is such a thing as hell. I think when someone actually does commit suicide, like if my suicide attempt had worked, yeah, I would have gotten out of the pain and I would have been greeted by all the angels in heaven. But then I would have had to come back here on earth in another body to learn the lessons that I didn't learn in this lifetime, because I think we're here on earth to learn how to love unconditionally, you know, and eventually when we learn that lesson, we'll be able to stay in heaven. Like the Mm. the world is a classroom. Heaven is a place of peace, love, joy, and happiness. So again, we never die because our soul lives on forever. We do release our body when our time in this classroom is over. So if we ultimately like learn how to love unconditionally, well, then we might choose not to get reincarnated again. I think we just keep coming in body after body until we learn how to just love everybody totally and equally. If entry into heaven is predicated on loving everybody unconditionally, then is there actually anyone in heaven? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I, Jesus Christ is in heaven. The Buddha is in heaven. Okay. I mean, there's, yes. there's a lot of souls in heaven. Yes, All there right. is. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, I guess we go to heaven, you know, we hang out for a while. And if we feel there's, there's, or, you know, source energy feels like there's more lessons for us to learn, then we come back in, in other bodies to learn the lessons that we need to learn in order to open our hearts. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, there's definitely people in heaven. And there's also, or souls, I shouldn't say people, there's souls in heaven. And there's also, we have a lot of support while we're we're on the earth like i believe in in spirits and angels and i believe there's there's support for for all of us when we when we ask for it thank you for that susan and thank you for everything you've shared i really appreciate it is there anything else you want to add question i didn't ask point you wanted to make mike is yours well thank you this was really fun those were those were fabulous questions oh, and i enjoyed yeah. my time with you sean um, I mean, my my introduction starts out for my book, and this is it was downloaded to me about five years ago. My passion is God. God is love and joy and beauty. He is all that is good in the world. Everything else is our own miscreation. When we are filled with joy, we are connected to God. When we are not joyful, we have lost our connection to all that is real. So I I believe that our our true state is is one of joy. I also think there's a lot of blocks that we need to be aware of 
you know, while we're down here. And that's also what A Course in Miracles helps us do, like identify the blocks. So when the blocks come up, we can look at them, see that they know how have no power over us and we can release them. When I'm, I'm, you know, not feeling fully centered, my book talks about like different different ways to to calm down and stay fully present in myself it's it's i talk a lot about about forgiveness and gratitude and and how important that is so there's a lot that goes into just feeling connected grateful for the the time i've spent here with you likewise i'm grateful and i appreciate it very much i know and i'm always pleasantly surprised when people reach out and then we are able to coordinate and actually have these conversations. So thank you very much. And I have no doubt that when people hear this and read your book, it'll help some. And that's a damn good thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I I Um, really appreciate your time and you having me on. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Bye. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. And special thanks to Susan up in Massachusetts. Thank you, Susan. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. As always, check the show notes for different ways you can contact us, our programs and presentations and membership and all the good stuff. Check out the show notes. It's all there. And that is all for episode number 147. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.